Hey, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to Cartoon One. Um, today, we are going to listen to Mr. Jason Coombs talk to us about zero defect software, and I'll let him introduce himself. Good morning. Uh, thanks, everybody. Welcome to the conference. Welcome to Pi Ohio 2019. Um, again, my name is Jason, and I'll be talking about zero defect software. Um, tell you a little bit about me, my background. I started out early in computer programming in undergraduate with uh, CS and math. And my first, prog first formal programming language was in Scheme. So that's a Lisp-based programming language, and that had a lot of influence on, uh, and was really foundational in my way of thinking about computer programming and how programs are modeled. I also took a course in zero defect software in which we, dis we discussed clean room development. So, you know, my passion, I imagine I share with a lot of you, is, is in writing code that's reliable, reusable, uh, sophisticated. Right? Sophistication is really what we're after, right? Raising our uh, ability, our, it, advancing our civilization with the software. And so after several decades of, of hacking and, and seeking grading, greater capability in programming, I've encountered some lessons uh, and accumulated some patterns that work well for me. And so inspired by a tweet, so a couple of years ago somebody tweeted and said, what is it about your code that I find so compelling, that I find you know, particularly uh, valuable? And I didn't really have an answer to that, but I reflected on it for a while and, and, and came up with three basic things that I distilled as my inspiration or the things that are most foundational in what I write. Uh, refactoring, functional programming, and clean room development. So those are the th three things I'm going to go through today. I'm going to go into detail on each and, and kind of draw them together in how they form my foundation. So refactoring, I didn't discover until mm, 2007 or so. Uh, I was working in Java. I was introduced to this uh, book by Martin Fowler called Refactoring. If you haven't read it and you do code as your daily your daily work, or you you have a, a hobby and you spend a lot of time in it. Um, that's that's new. Uh, <laughs> that's that's a screenshot of the book, but you don't need that. You can get it on Amazon. It, it's showing on my screen, just FYI. Uh, but yeah, the, the, this it, I've been I've heard it described as the single book that most influenced pr my programming for the better. And I completely can echo that sentiment. Um, often when you receive code or even you take code that you, look, that you worked on six months ago, you look at it and the implementation is the spec. You get code where you, you have no specification, you don't have, have no user requirements. Your implementation is the best thing that you have. Uh, your best source of truth, all the assumptions are baked in. And, and so you have to kind of derive the, the, the assumptions, the specifications from that code, uh, extract institutional knowledge that may have been lost from the people who wrote it, who may no longer be there, and try to separate out the legacy behaviors, the, the things that just happened to be part of the, the code versus the things that you really wanted to be part of the code, the specifications. Um, and so, so uh, you know, what does it mean to factor the code? Uh, what does a factor mean? Well, it's a, a, a portion of the code. It's an aspect of the code. It's a semantic construct. And, and like an interface or, or a concrete one, like an object or a function. Uh, and what you want to aim for is the essential pieces of that. You know, fact create the factors that make the code structured the way you want it to behave. Uh, and so refactoring differs from basic editing in that you use proven operations and, and mi many of those can be mechanized. So proven operations to, to rewrite the code or to realign it. Uh, some of the tools or techniques you, you, you might apply, uh, Eclipse IDE was the first one I used. It had the mechanical refactorings for Java and, and I was programming in Java at the time and I was really impressed with how many operations were mechanically available. 
where you could select a, a, a segment of code and it would extract it out into a function for you or rename a, a series of classes across, uh, across a whole code base. Um, at the time, that seemed impossible for a language like Python because Python is dynamically typed. It's in, in some ways weakly typed. And so I was thoroughly impressed when, when JetBrains and PyCharm created refactorings, automated refactorings for Python. Uh, those are the tool, two tools that I've used and I'm familiar with. There may be others out there, but uh, I highly recommend if you're doing refactorings, if you're getting to know code, get a good IDE like JetBrains, PyCharm. But you can still do your refactorings manually as well. So uh, maybe your editor is Sublime, maybe your editor is Vim, uh, just straight out of the box, or, or you know something even more primitive. Uh, you can still do manual refactorings, but it means you know uh, taking a look, you know, read the book, study the the, the sorts of operations you can do, and then apply those uh, very selectively, um, such that every refactoring you do creates a stable change, something that you can commit with confidence, and but but structures your code in a way that's uh, starts to lead toward a more elegant, more simple design, so that you can proceed with implementing your uh, the features that you're after. So uh, you might refactor to, to learn a new code base, and I will often do this myself. So I, ex I get to a new code base, something that I'm trying to learn and understand, and I, I might you know, uh, apply some, some refactorings to it just to see what happens, just to see what pieces of code are affected or what changes that might have. Uh, sometimes I'll keep the refactorings, other times uh, I'll, I'll throw them away but it, it can be useful for understanding the structure and makeup of code. So reshape the code to match your conceptual needs, whatever it is you're, you're aiming to, to get done, and always keep the, keep the code pieces as small as possible. Right? The concepts, the, the, the smaller they are, the simpler they are, the less uh, um, you will need to, to, uh, to, t to verify in other things, and that will come up later on. So uh, in this talk, I'm, I'm going to be pulling up a few code samples, well, a few code examples, and some of these are, uh, many of them are dredged from my very first production code, a piece of, um, it, it took, it took a, a data file and sorted it in a particular way that, that was useful for the uh, semiconductor company I was working for. And I, I found this in a journal that, that I was keeping from, from my job at the time, and it was written in C, and I retyped it all up and then ported it to Python. So uh, the, these hyperlinks are live. If you come back to this uh, presentation at some point, you can actually find these in GitHub. So here I have an example of extracting a function using, using PyCharm. And I'm going to hope this is going to work. And it's not. Oh, I had this working earlier. I'm going to try, let it be. Uh, OK. OK, I think it's coming through. Give it 10 more seconds. Hopefully, I'll get the, the capture portal. It's just not coming up. OK. Going to bail on the live code samples. Uh, so, but I took a, a piece of code that was embedded. And my, let me describe the, the, this legacy code for you. It was basically one giant function in a main. And lots of loops and lots of ifs and opening up several files all in one, play, uh, one main function. Um, so one of the things I did, I took PyCharm, s selected part of an else block, and just said extract a method. They use the term method, but it also works for functions. And it just extracted it, figured out what all of the local variables were that needed to be included in that function, made those parameters to the function, and then took the re return value and assigned that to a, to a parameter, uh, to, to an output. And so I took 150 lines of code, no longer in the main function. Now they're in a separate function. Now I can focus on that 150 lines of code optimize it, maybe take out some of those parameters that weren't needed or could be handled a different way, and, and continue to iterate on that. 
Uh, the second facet is functional programming. So I, I mentioned Scheme, which is a, a derivation of Lisp. It's a functional programming language. And by being thrown into that as my first formal instruction, I it, it just completely reframed the way I th thought about programming from that moment on. And so what, it, what is it in a nutshell? Functional programming is not probably not the way you were taught to program, not, probably not the way you taught yourself, uh, because it's not just a series of procedures, a, a series of, uh, of steps, but it's more uh, about emphasizing expressions over statements. So in the same way that you think about mathematical functions and how they just express in, in the ether a concept, uh, and then they're tied together, they, they're applied to each other, uh, that's the kind of conceptual view of, of functional programming. And then the, the state is localized. As much as possible in functional programming, you want to avoid mutating global state, mutating state outside of the function that you're operating in so that a function is a, an isolated component of behavior. So the, the benefits you know, of stateless means that you have no side effects. That means when you're looking at the function itself, when you're reviewing it, when you're thinking about it conceptually, you can, assuming you've implemented it with no state, you can assume that it's not mutating state, that it can be applied uh, perhaps in multiprocessing across a number of, uh, of different processes that are running at the same time. Uh, and it's not going to have interactions that you have to consider. And interactions are a form of complexity that make it make make uh, programming difficult and and challenging. So avoiding those interactions, except at the input, the parameters, and the output of the function, um, you can simplify the the way you consider and, and work with the code. It also allows you to f focus on what machines do best, which is performing an operation. Uh, over a, a number of inputs, an, an arbitrary, perhaps even unlimited number of inputs. So if you have uh, a, um, a, a series of numbers that users are entering, you can, you can just say, I'm going to apply this function that's known to take numbers and perform some th operation on them. And so it becomes a generalizable abstraction, and, and so the simple concepts can be reused and are, are more scalable. It's the foundation of what map reduce. In, in fact, map and reduce are functional programming uh, concepts. And, and so that's the foundation of, uh, of Hadoop and, and other large scale data operations. So here's an example of a, a for append loop uh, where, and the, I see this pattern a lot, and I consider this something of an anti-pattern, where you create a list, uh, and then you uh, iterate over something and append the, the output of an operation on that list. Obviously, Python has done very well introducing uh, comprehensions in Python 2.4 uh, for, um, for list comprehensions. Later, we, we get the generator expressions and other things that allow you to take this concept. But you'll notice here the handle function is you know just taking an input and giving you an output, and the the uh, list comprehension allows you to very simply express that concept, and so you, you'll want to do that uh, frequently. Uh, as much as possible, keep the function simple. Uh, one one output parameter in particular, uh, and as few input parameters as possible. So try to avoid. Um, unnecessary parameters and and also rely on the exceptions uh, for, for exceptional uh, exceptional conditions so here's where Python really shines uh, it's its patterns its influence um, tend to drive you in this direction anyway uh, other languages like go require exceptional conditions to be handled in band and I, I find that uh, a little uh, gives me a little bit of consternation um, and let's see, so also as you're writing your functions, uh, try to think of them as single word actions. Try to phrase, frame them in such a way that they aren't involving their context or their parameters. Let the, uh, let the scope describe you know, the class of things that it does. Let the parameters describe the things that it operates on and let the function describe the action that happens. So instead of string dot string underscore lowercase underscore input, taking input, 
uh, just use string.lower input. Uh, or similar, instead of having two functions for dedenting a piece of text and stripping the left, uh, the left white space off of it, uh, have two separate functions, one which is dedent, one which is lstrip, and then the, having one function call the next is uh, how they work together. So I want to talk quickly about a few of the functional programming primitives. I mentioned map and reduce as, as you know as being kind of foundational to uh, Hadoop, but uh, also compose, which is an operation. Um, well, I'll, I'll get I'll get into that. So mapping is taking a series of inputs and producing a series of outputs, uh, you know, one to one. So for for each thing in in a sequence. Uh, produce an output on each of those items. Reduce takes a whole series of inputs and then aggregates those into a single output. Um, so here's an example from, from the sample code where uh, I, I had an A2I implementation. And if you've started out early in computer science, you may have written one of these. You may have written one of these for a computer science computation or a, um, a coding interview. But basically, you know, take a, a series of characters and convert those into an integer. And in this particular uh, implementation, it, it ignores everything that's not, everything after a non digit. And this is written in a, a, a procedural way where there's an initialization, there's a while loop, it's looping over the characters in the array, in the string array. And, and then using ordinal, um, the Python ordinal, to determine what the number is that's appropriate there. But consider instead this implementation, which is a little more functional. And I've, uh, I've extracted several functions to perform portions of this. But you'll see I've taken, in the first step, get digits. So given a string x, return all the digits from that string. In the second step, I've used map. And I've taken... Uh, I'm, I'm applying map ord zero, which means get the ordinal relative to the zero character and apply that to each of the digits. So that gives me a bunch of ordinals. And then finally, I use the, the reduce function from func tools. And, and I say apply 10x on these ordinals. And 10x is um, a way of saying multiply this larger number by 10 and then add the new number. And, and so you, you're taking each of those and reducing them into a single number by multiplying one by 10. So it's the same concept, but you can see that it's a little more concise. Each of those functions can be tested independently, and, and then the full implementation is linked, linked in there. Yeah, so 10 underscore x, and if I had internet, I, I could go to the implementation, but it, it takes two numbers. Uh, it multiplies the first number by 10 and adds it to the other number, returns the result. Um, I'm missing, I have a syntax error in my, uh, in my slide code, so I won't be able to show you composition uh, as a mathematical concept. Um, but composition is, is the, the concept of taking two functions, f1, f2, and having the result of one be the input of the, of the other, and that's usually written f1 dot f2 in, in mathematical not notation. In Python, uh, I, I've done the same thing here. So I've taken two functions, one which represents the square of a number, the other which represents adding one to a number, and, and I've created a new function using a compose operator. Now, compose is something that I've written and I, I make available through a library called juraco.functools. But um, you could write your own as well. It's actually, I think, one or two lines of, of actual code. But you can, take, you can create a new function based on those two functions. So now this new function f will, uh, will square a number and then add one to it. I mentioned partial as well. So partial is built into the standard library. And it's part of the functools module. And here's where you can take an existing function that maybe has many parameters to it and wrap it in something that only takes maybe one parameter. And so that can be really useful if, for example, you want to use map with a function that always adds 
one, instead of writing F1 like I did explicitly before, you could actually take an add n, make it more specific to always add one. Let's see. Uh, checking for time, I'm just going to skip a few here. So, so uh, let me. Uh, I want to. So, I, I do talk a little bit about Boolean parameters. Uh, I, I suggest avoiding them, um, especially if they alter the the use of the code. It, it, they alter the, the the chain of the code at the beginning or the end of the function only. Uh, usually, something like that can be rewritten to to be separate functions and and and. You just have the caller call those themselves. The third uh, and kind of the, the highlight here is the clean room development. This is where zero defect comes from. And this is the approach that was based on research from world class firms like IBM. And it, it, there, there are different levels of, of zero defect you know, approaches. You can take the clean room uh, approach is meant to, you know, ideally is mathematically provable. That you go into the code and you make sure that you can prove mathematically that this function always does what you intend for it to do. Um, that approach is very expensive. Um, sometimes it can be done with brute force, but even then it is often intractable. Uh, you can also use property-based testing, which is a little more efficient uh, as far as proving it. But there are, there are lower levels of rigor that, that you will often want to employ instead. Uh, you can write verifiably correct code. That is, you can write code that could be verified, uh, and 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 then to verify, you know, verify that it's correct, you know, according to certain specifications. Or you can simply write code that's intended to be written for verifiability. You you intend for it to be reviewed and and checked for you know boundary conditions and other common mistakes. So the theory is basically you know, careful specification. Uh, every function, every component, every control construct should be uh, specified as clearly and precisely and, and thoroughly as possible. Uh, in this way, you catch many more errors before compile time or execution time in the case of something like Python. And, and so it's about understanding the program thoroughly and rigorous reviews. So a big part of clean room development is involving at least one other developer, usually a team of developers, to inspect the code, discuss it, understand it, and make sure that it meets its specifications. Uh, so in practice, only the most simple code is mathematically provable. Um, we, there are parts of, of industry that do mathematically prove code, and that's usually for code that has to run right the first time. Uh, most of our code doesn't have to run right the first time. We have lots of ways of managing that. Um, but uh, so, you know, as a, as a corollary, only the simple code is verifiable. So we want to write our code to be as simple as possible, limit the number of states, limit the number of things that have to be considered during review, declare and enforce your constraints. So your inputs, your outputs, make sure that they're, they're well specified, that, it, that it's understood what they're meant to do. Use uh, you know, type annotations if that's helpful. Use assertions if that's useful. Um, or you know, include in the doc, in documentation what are the expected inputs and outputs and what are the unexpected ones, you know, what is not supported. You know, so that if somebody comes into that code and maybe they're depending on an implicit assumption, it can be declared that it's, that, that that's not really a supported use of it. And then use refactoring and functional programming uh, to safely simplify your code. So I mentioned legacy code you know, is, is often just the spec. So, uh, but the expectations I have with clean room development, uh, you're going to have a slower time to your initial release. You're going to spend more time inspecting your code reviewing your code. Like I said, if you do this rigorously, you're, you're doing all of these reviews before you've even run tests. Later you run tests, later you run execution, and you, and you, and you do some additional work on it. Um, but in practice, uh, the, the theory shows that, that you will have a, a faster development life cycle, and you will have fewer defects in production as a result. Uh, I, I also wanted to emphasize you know, the limiting of state. Um, and there are lots of different ways there can be state. You can have global variables. You can have other things. But even within one function, um, 
if statements, branching logic, these all create state. These all create interactions between one part of the code and another, interactions that maybe you don't want. Um, I've heard the phrase if is a new go-to, and I think that's actually a talk later this afternoon. Ali uh, Sivji will be, be talking on that this afternoon, so I, I highly recommend it. I'm looking forward to attending that. So think of, uh, think of if as the new go-to. Uh, so I, I threw together a quick example again from, from that legacy code that had been, that I ported to Python. Here's a case where the main function, there was no branches, then there was a, an opening of a file. Uh, the file handle isn't saved anywhere, which means that it's not used anywhere after this, this call, and, and the, expressions are, the exception is trapped. So I, from this code, needed to inf infer the purpose. What did I mean from this? Now, I wrote this, but I don't, I don't know why I wrote it. <laughs> uh, derive a specification and, and extract a function. So I went ahead and, and extracted this truncate function, and gave it a doc string, gave it a little bit of a specification, so unconditionally ensure the named file exists and is truncated. And, and then call that within main. You can't see it, it gets kind of cut off at the bottom there, but uh, it, it basically calls truncate where, that, where this block was before. But now, looking at this code, I can say to myself, well, okay. So if all I wanted to do was unconditionally ensure the named file exists and is truncated, do I, do I need this uh, exception handling? I don't think I do. So rewrite it. You know, do some optimization now on this function uh, that simply opens the file and closes it. Maybe there are other ways. You know, may maybe this function already exists in, in the standard library. Maybe somebody's written this in something that's a file utils or something. Uh, so that I don't have to maintain it and support it, maintain the spec, all of those other things. I can rely on them to run the tests and keep it, uh, keep it robust. So that's a, an example of <clears throat> you know, using functional programming the, the refactoring and uh, and the clean room approach to to improving the software. So uh, it, you know, in summary, uh, all you know, all together, these approaches reduce interactions, thereby reducing complexity. As you, you've heard from the Zen of Python, elegance begets simplicity. So this is where Python shines. Fun you know, it, you can use functional programming, but you can also draw in object-oriented imperative where appropriate. Um, follow robust patterns for exception handling, and work toward a, a zero defect solution. I did want to mention, uh, you, you know, there are, this isn't everything, right? There are other techniques that are really powerful and useful in software development. OO programming, test documentation to behavior driven development. There are lots of ways to, to enforce the intended behaviors. Uh, use of static analysis tools, which will help you catch things as you're coding um, before you get to that review point. Uh, try to try to be agile. Try to fail fast. Uh, iterate quickly, and, um, and and optimize for the correctness of design, and and you know disregard the the con concerns of performance early. You know optimize later. Avoid uh, optimizing late. So I, I wrote Q and A here, but there's no time for Q and A. I'll be I'll be out in the hall. I'll be happy to answer questions. Uh, my Twitter, GitHub. I'm known as Jiraco everywhere. And these slides are linked on bit.ly 0-defect-19 if you want to review them or link to the code or, or uh, explore it any further. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>